2. Sinchi Roka the Second Inca, the Sprinter Slowly walking on the deserted streets of Cuzco, I glimpse a building in construction, imposing mainly for what it represents, a university of sorts. As I get closer, the guards probe my reasons for being there. After explaining my unbelievable quest of traveling to the past, they let me into their house of learning. I see young people, among them one wearing a distinctive yellow headband. He is the son of Manco Capac, whom I have come to meet. Throwing his poncho over his shoulders, he walks assertively toward me, while his peers follow him. They surround me, and I welcome their inquisitive looks. Stranger. Where do you come from? Young Inca, first introduce me to your teachers and classmates. We will learn from each other, which is the purpose for my being here. On the main patio, we sit on the floor of cut stones. I open the discussion, and I begin to answer their incessant inquiring, Who am I? Where am I going, and what for? Those are questions that we have been asking ourselves from the beginning of time, and we still have no answers in a universe in which only our passions make us feel that we exist. Sinchi Roka, pensive, looks at me with that youthful disdain for the esoteric. You have traveled this far back in time, only to find the futility of your quest. I have also been thinking of the reasons for our existence, more so in these lands of unending and desolate mountains. Young Inca, you speak with a great understanding of your surroundings. It is impossible to comprehend how detached the Andean world was from other civilizations. One of the teachers asks me, why do you say we were isolated? Are there other worlds beside ours? Yes, there are five continents. You occupied a very small part of the new world without knowledge of the existence of other civilizations. Even if the Aztecs or the Incas had conquered each other, both were at the same stage of development, so no meaningful exchange of ideas would have occurred. Unlike in the old world where there were cultures at different levels of development. When they arrived on our shores they brought new advances, placing the inhabitants of the newfound continent at a disadvantage, and questioning if their inhabitants were human beings. That is why I am here to find who am I, and the only ones to whom I can reach for answers are you, the dead. Man of the future, I sense your dilemma. Tell me if our heritage was lost with the ages, and if our descendants remember us? Young Inca, little of our spiritual essence has survived, and it is presently denied by our own people. The only patrimony we accept as a testament of your greatness are the massive stone ruins. At this point, the students want to hear of the wonders of the future rather than my personal conflicts. One of the tutors addresses me in an inquisitive voice, would think that the ravages of human weakness have disappeared in your times? I can see that you still have the same problems that we had, in spite of the enlightenment of the old world. That is the predicament of mankind, and perhaps we will never be able to achieve harmony among the nations of the world. Why not? Because our negative passions will remain with us, as a constant reminder that we must strive toward perfection, a quest that will continue for the rest of our humanity. A student asks, what is material progress for, if there are no changes in our human nature? Young Inca, a very difficult question to answer. I wouldn't be here if the technological advances had enhanced. Our spiritual makeup. It is possible that in the distant future, with our computerized knowledge, we will become humanoids without any emotions. When that time comes, I hope that we will be programmed by either God or men with a profound respect for each other. Sinchi Roka questions me, where are you leading us with this discussion? Did you come to disenchant us of your present or are we to enlighten you with our past? What is it that you are looking for? My coming into your past is to find out who you were as men of history, and perhaps comprehend your legacy left. To us. That is why my discussion has no practical goals other than to let the flow of our thoughts drift into our collective consciousness to understand who we are. Although mankind has acquired unimaginable technology, those advances are only tools to explore our surroundings, 
but it will never change our inner beings. It is possible that our material accomplishments will eventually reduce us to immaterial matter, mind, and spirit, like the gods we have invented to make of our nothingness something that is comprehensible. You are conveying what we all think, but we do not express tell us more about that old world. I was saying that you formed an empire isolated from the rest of the planet, while great intellectual events were happening in the old world. Unfortunately, that acquired wisdom did not influence our conquerors who were possessed by the material advances of their times, and they came to usurp the new world. Man of the future, conquests are carried out by warriors. And not by men of thought. Aren't you unjustly accusing them? Wars are to be won or to be lost. Yes, but the victors can also be enlightened by the ideals of the vanquished, as it happened with the powerful Roman Empire that became the spiritual seat of the very same people whom they humiliated and who believed in a merciful God. If their faith was the cause of a just God, why are my descendants so destitute? Your question is revelant, because Christianity was the same religion that the conquerors brought to our shores, and look how your descendants find themselves in our present. Then, the invaders acted differently in spite of the great teachings of their faith? Yes, and as you said, war is war, but ours was a genocide. Counter soul, the victor has the right to impose his will on the vanquished. Not necessarily, our conquerors did not suffer indignities when the Moors occupied their lands. Who were those people that did not humiliate the vanquished? They were the Arabs who were intruding into the Western civilization, and they occupied Spain for 700 years, yet, the Spaniards kept their dignity. However, once liberated, they came to the American continent and they never gave the natives a chance to keep, at least, their humanness. Man of the future, it is important that you make these comparisons to have an idea of the people who will come to usurp our empire. Since you are in the past, it is appropriate that I show you the old city of Cuzco while we discuss what happened to us and why. I bid goodbye to the students, apologizing for doing all. The talking. They understand that it is the visitor who has the most to tell, in their case of transcendental importance due to the centuries of difference. Walking on the narrow streets, I question the young Inca of the historical events that made an impression on him. Countersoul, my life was besieged with more sadness than joy. I witnessed the wickedness of the people which may be acceptable among strangers but not within members of one's own family. As my father told you, they had intrigues among themselves. Perhaps to the point of fratricidal events. Menko Kapak became an exceptional leader, always taking care of his people. At the age of fifteen, I practically became a co-ruler with him who was getting old. But he still had a lot of vigor to come up with new ceremonies, like the Warachaku that tests the fitness of the young Inca nobles advancing into manhood. You are going to witness these difficult exercises that will be carried out for the first time, and the last festivity that my father attended before he joined Inti. I heard from Manco Kapak that you were an excellent athlete and a well-trained warrior. However, you never had to use those skills, because he taught you how to win without violence. Yes, he used to say that to be prepared for conflicts was a way to avoid wars. You will observe these games. Maybe you can take part in some of these events and evaluate my abilities. I could not keep up with you in these high altitudes, but... I can certainly match your enthusiasm. Is that why you are wheezing? Young Inca, we have advanced so much that that progress has also changed our world, sometimes for the worse. Many are suffering strange ailments, like my labored breathing, due to the contaminated environment. What is that, man of the future? It is as if one was breathing the fumes of the llama manure that you used for cooking, which causes no harm. But the fuels that we burn nowadays do not smell as bad, yet it can kill silently. One would think that the people of the future should prevent any environmental problems, but it seems that they are adding some that are deadly. Yes, Inca. We have magnified them exponentially. In our times, we have weapons of mass destruction, the size of your Makana Club, that can make Cusco disappear in a cloud of smoke. 
If many are used, it could disintegrate our planet. We are experiencing a technological avalanche, perhaps unparalleled in the history of our universe, so much so that we are sending spacecrafts into the void of the unknown, but so far we have not seen any signs of life. Countersoul, you are making me dizzy with this incredible talk. Runners. Help this man of the future into my litter. He is either sick from the thin air or the chicha that he has invived. Young Inca, I cannot permit to be transported by human carriers. I feel that I am fostering the servitude of our own people. Countersoul, if you spoke to them, you will find that it is a privilege to serve the royalty in this fashion. I am sensitized to any kind of human demeaning that is tantamount to humiliation, for slaves is what all your descendants, nobles or not, ended up being at the hands of foreigners. Although slavery was symbolically abolished in our times, your full and half-blooded descendants still have the innate ability to enslave each other. Nevertheless, I will accept this ride on account of my shortness of breath. I understand that running is one of the main events, and you are expected to be the winner. I want you to know that I once ran a marathon. That experience was one of my most exhilarating personal achievements. As you can see, I am interested in these games. I hope not to disappoint you. You also seem to be running in your mind, as if you were escaping from something. Yes. From my past. Tell me more about these festivities that I am to witness. In these games only young people of royal blood are allowed to participate. Old warriors, who themselves were experienced athletes, will serve as referees. First, we will fast for six days to prove that we are able to withstand the rigors of hunger and thirst expected in times of war. Then we will get ready for the long-distance run. From where to where will this event take place? It will begin on the sacred hill of Hunacare and end in the Sacsayhuaman Bluff. You may remain with the royal family in the viewing stand. No. I prefer to be with the people to cheer you up, and perhaps run a few stretches beside you. I will be looking for you among the spectators. Porters. Take me as fast as you can to the starting line. The contestants cannot begin without me. Where is Ali Rio? The master runner. He has to give the signal to start. Prince Sinchi Roka, the greatest chasky runner of all time, is walking slowly due to his old age. Great Ali Rio. Finally you are here, we are ready, give us the signal. Young Incas and you, Sinchi Roka, the captain, take your positions. You know the rules, no cutting in front of another. The first one who reaches to the finish line picks up our Inca banner. Let us pray to the sun before we begin. O oh, Inti! You who have fathered these young nobles, I taught when they were boys, as adolescents they have trained to become the best. They will run fair and fast, and some day, when their lives turn into gold, they will remember that in these games, they became men of age. At the sounds of the shells, the young Incas put their left foot forward, raising clouds of dust, and they start in a stampede that can be seen and heard halfway down the course. From a distance, I feel the vibrations of their pounding feet. Distinguished from the rest by his yellow headband, Sinchi Roca is ahead of the pack. I make my way among the crowd to greet him. In the excitement, I try to run by his side while cheering him up, Sinchi Roca. They will not catch up with you. You are the lord of the Chaskis. He swiftly passes me by. I begin to feel the effects of my short run. Dizzy and faint, I exit the crowd. I sit on the ground. Some offer me chicha, which I gladly accept. I ask the porters to take me to the finish line where the young prince is already holding the multicolored banner, signifying that he had won. Sinchi Roka. You are the best. The people will respect you on your own merits. Counter soul. What were you doing running alongside? Me? At your age and in your condition, you had me worried. Young Inca, I could not contain my excitement. You reminded me of my youth, 
and running like a chaska has been a dream come true in this encounter. At dusk, the people retire. Anticipating the next day's event, which will entail attacking and defending the hill of Saxehuaman. Counter soul, I will remain to study the area. You are welcome to stay. The exercise that you are to witness tomorrow will be a bloody one, in spite of being only a mock event. Nothing would please me more than to sleep under a blanket of shining stars, while reminiscing of the past. Man of the future, I have never heard anyone who recalls his past as passionately as you do, and so painful to listen to. Do you want to know why? Why? Because I see and I remember our Indian brothers drowning in a puddle of anguished tears from the thunderous past, the harshness of the present, and the hopelessness of their future. As my age consumes my desire to do something, I feel helpless and yet committed to make the world aware of their predicament. Unfortunately, it is only you, the dead, who listens to our vicissitudes. For the living are as dead, as you are. Is it possible that you have experienced so much misery, and you never had one moment of happiness in your country of birth? Oh, Inca, if you were to live in my days and witness the degradation of the human spirit, you would also have the same feelings that I have for the Indians. Then you will know that our mission is to change their destiny. Man of the future, can't you rejoice in the greatness of your past and enlighten your thoughts with a different destiny that we could have had? I wish I could, and I wouldn't be taking this journey. Enough of your sordid thoughts. I must address the logistics and defense of the hill. We can continue our discussion before we fall asleep, if we can sleep on this frigid mound. Listen up. Let us plan how are we going to defend ourselves from being overtaken. I will divide our band in three groups under capable men, who are respected by you. Huangqi, Yenkei, and Kut Yuri, as captains you will be free to act according to your warrior instincts. I, as your leader, will be on the move so as not to be targeted. Our mission is not to give up the hill. We will remain in place until they come. When they reach to the top, the opponents will be exhausted, and it should be easy to subdue them. Let us have a good night's rest. The event will take place as soon as Inti rises. Early in the morning, Sinchi Roka summons his warriors. Comrades. Don't try to maim your adversary, even if they want to hurt you. Show them that we can also be chivalrous in. The midst of battle. Shouting and wielding their weapons, both parties show their readiness for this mock battle. They throw spears at their opponents, regardless of where it will land. A young Inca from the opposite side is gushing blood from one eye. Another one has received a blow to the head and falls, as if mortally wounded. I see the perpetrator wearing a yellow headband and holding his golden club. He is Sinchi Roca, who is letting everyone know that nobody can outdo him in battle. At sunset, Sinchi Roca's party has won. The winner will be decided the following day when they assume opposite roles. The next day, they meet at the bottom, this time on the offensive. By now, Sinchi Roca knows the weakness of his opponents. The stakes are not as crucial as in their first encounter. He states that there is more to defending one's own ground than taking someone else's position. Sinchi Roca is fighting as if he were against true adversaries. He knows that it will prevent him from future conflicts with those who are sizing him up as a warrior. Once victory is half won, the prince confines himself to control the ferocity of his young warriors. The final events test their strength, accuracy, and determination. One of the old masters addresses the contestants, so far you have fasted, run, and fought a mock war. Today, you have to prove one more time the rite of passage into manhood. Counter soul, I want you to come this afternoon for the Waraka Sling Contest, a long-range weapon of precision. My uncle Iyer Cash was unequaled in its dexterous use, probably no one will ever match him. I am half as good as he was, and that makes me the best. By mid-afternoon, the outskirts of Cusco are crowded. The Young noble 
bulls will throw stones in rapid succession to previously placed targets while running with their whirling sling around the periphery of the sacred city, a spectacle not to be missed. The prince arrives splendidly dressed in a multicolored poncho carrying a bag filled with round stones and a sling knitted by his aging mother. Countersoul, I will explain to you the secrets of handling this instrument of war and hunting made of the longest strands of llama wool to give it flexibility and strength. First, fix your sight at what you are aiming, keeping the object in your mind while you are whirling the sling with as much force as you can. Harness from your arm. When you are sure that you want to release the stone, look once more at your target and let one side of the sling go. You will hear the stone whiz to where you have aimed. For accuracy, use round stones, although any shape will do. You will see that when I run out of my own supply, and I pick any stone from the floor. Here comes Taruka, the master of this event. He knew my uncle, and he has been my instructor for years. Young Sinchi Roka, are you ready? Early in the day, other young nobles took their chances. Very few did as well, as I expect from you. You are the last contestant, the event will end with your great demonstration. I have placed weeded effigies of condors at short intervals around the city. You may shoot at them as frequently and as fast as you can while running. The object is to hit as many in the shortest time possible. The winner is the one who does both. With the grace of a performer, as if dancing to the tune. Of an Inca Hueno music, he begins to hit the targets, missing only a few. The young prince rapidly finishes circling the city, and he is proclaimed the winner. Sinchi Roca, that was a beautiful sight. From the distance, I could see your silhouette moving against the background of the golden sunset. Hunter Soul, the most grueling of all events are yet to come. It will be like closing the games with blood. We are going to be beaten to simulate the same effects sustained in the battlefields. The master of the ceremony speaks, young Incas. These next exercises are to castigate you to the limits of your endurance. There is nothing you can do, and that is exactly what we want you to do, nothing. You should be able to withstand punishment without showing any fear or signs of pain. Aunt Viterco, bring your men to whip the contestants with the fresh branches of poison ivy. Let us start with the prince, so that he can give us a demonstration of his determination to withstand pain. Make sure that his legs and arms are well exposed. Sinchi Roca. The people will be looking to see if you blink an eye or shift your legs. If you cannot control your reflexes, you will be disqualified. That goes for all of you. If you can't stand still to the lashing of such pliable materials, it will mean that you won't be able to endure the blows of the solid weapons from your enemies. We expect you to remain motionless, as if you felt nothing. Masters. Begin with Sinchi Roka. Hit him as hard as you can, and don't mind that he is a prince. Otherwise, he will be disgusted with you. The young Inca shuts down all his reflexes and appears insensible to the blows. The men are lashing at him, as if he had done them wrong. Tired and short of breath, the branches no longer useful, they stop punishing. Him. The prince's legs and back are bleeding, but his willpower is unshaken. The people begin to exclaim, he is the son of the sun. He will be a good warrior. Finishing these words, Aunt Viterco orders the lashers to do the same with the rest. A few are incapable of bearing the pain. The quitters are mocked by their own families, which hurts them more than the blows. Sinchi Roca, they say that the next exercise goes beyond the limits of human endurance. I can see that this is going to be a favorite event by the arrival of more spectators. Aunt Viterco, asks the contenders, do you want to finish or postpone this event until tomorrow? No. Let us finish today, if your assistants are not too drunk to continue. The well-seasoned warriors, who will test their courage, make ferocious passes with their clubs of solid wood and wield their lances of copper. Aunt Viterco calls to begin with the last exercise. Young Incas. Line up on each side of this narrow street. 
Sinchi Roka, you will be at the head of your group to give an example of what it is to be fearless, as you valiantly so far have demonstrated. Old warriors and masters. Stop drinking. Come to do what you have been anticipating, rip the souls of these men to be. Yes, Aunt Viterko. We are ready to start. I with my Makana. Club at this end, and the fearless Chusakachi with his Chuka. Lance at the other. Young nobles. I want complete immobilization when they come to you with their weapons. Kira Vilka and Chusakachi. Start with your arms of preference, make sure not to maim anyone on purpose. Kira Vilka looks directly at the prince's eyes, showing his full set of stained green teeth, carelessly spattering some foul chewed coca on his face. Sinchi Roka. Do you think that you will stay put, ah? Uh? Look at this Makana that still has the blood of your enemies. With de dexterity, he starts to flaunt his heavy club right in front of him, while dancing and crisscrossing back and forth among the other contestants. Gaining momentum and as if in fury, he shouts to all, nobody moves. From the other end, the fearsome Chusakachi begins brandishing two heavy and long-pointed instruments. After showing how dexterous he is, he throws one. He begins by rapidly advancing while maneuvering his lance, as if he was ready to thrust the weapon into the stomach or eyes of the young Incas. Running and jumping without hurting anyone, he arrives with lightning speed at Sinchi Roka's station. Using his spike like a staff, he says, So you want to be a warrior, ah? Uh. Sinchi Roka looks at him in contempt for his drunken state. Chusakachi makes a quick make believe movement by directing the lance toward his body that, instead, passes in between his legs. The people look at the prince, who has remained static and furiously looking at his tormentor. Again, the master warrior points the lance at the young prince's face and slowly retracts the weapon, as if regaining momentum to thrust in between his eyes. Sinchi Roka remains motionless while he sees the spike coming directly at him. Chusakachi quickly withdraws the sharp instrument, zooming instead past his ears. He quickly jerks his head to see if the young Inca has blinked. The people gasp with a sense of relief. Laughing, the master goes from one young noble to the next, injuring one in the leg and another in the arm. One wounded noble writhes in pain. He is disqualified. The people yell, Coward! Coward! In this manner, the bearers of deadly weapons harass the competitors, maiming a few more, and finally they stop. Antviterko addresses them, if any of you was frightened, knowing that we meant no harm, imagine what would happen if you became petrified with fear in front of the enemy who meant to kill you? Sinchi Roka, you have remained motionless as a rock. We congratulate all. The games are over. You are now men and warriors. The next day the city prepares to celebrate the greatest of all ceremonies, the award of the insignias. In this reversal of the times, Menko Kapak and his royal entourage arrive at the main square of Akapita. The old Inca rises from his golden chair, assisted by his nobles. With his right arm, he greets everybody, and in a grave voice he begins to speak. Young nobles. Inti has given you the strength to finish these games, and earn the right to pass into manhood and knighthood. Do not relish with these vain accomplishments for time will tell the true meaning of your souls. Thus, with dignity and a sense of duty, receive the mark of nobility, which you must cherish and carry with honor, as befits to the sons of the sun. Having said these solemn words, one by one, almost crawling, the young Incas come to Menko Kapak's feet. Kneeling, the novices get their earlobes perforated with a thick golden pin. While losing profuse amounts of sanguine fluid, the new nobles delight with the warm flow of their royal blood. After the main rituals, their heads are crowned with the green branches of the Winehuena tree, which means forever young, to remind them that they should always be young in spirit. I watch Sinchi Roka go through the same formalities, 
except that instead of piercing his ears, which had already been done as a child, they insert heavy golden plugs in his enlarged, opened earlobes. Then, Menko Kapak places a red band with a yellow fringe that covers his forehead to signify that he is to be the next Inca lord, and his father's also gives him a golden axe while uttering in an imperceptible voice, for you to fight the unjust and traitors. Thus, man of the future, the festivities came to an end. My father officially crowned me as the leader of the forming empire. Thereafter, emotions could no longer be imposed on his ailing body. On a day that would never be forgotten, Manco Kapak bid us farewell forever. Soon after, Ayer Aka, my last uncle, and most of the people whom had so much to do with Manco Kapak, left this world. Sinchi Roka, is it only death that you can remember? Can you tell me about the most cherished of all emotions? Love. Oh. That is an illusory passion. If present, it was fleeting. Our unions were political compromises. I was married to the daughter of the powerful Lord of Kana with whom I had a son, Manko Sapaka. There was no love between you and her? Oh, yes. I cared for her, but the realities of continuing with the Inca lineage disrupted our lives. On the day of my coronation I had to marry one of my sisters, as my father had mandated. How can I explain that marriage to a sister had no meaning in the passions of the heart? It was so emotionless that only the sons of the gods have that priority. No one would ever spouse a sibling, unless it was for dynastic reasons. Young Inca, I never thought that you or the other Inca nobles married their sisters for the passion of love, but for something more sinister than that, the passion for power. That might be so. Once I took command of Cusco with my sister and wife, I spoke to my subjects. To all those who are not related by blood to us, from now on, you will be Incas of privilege, and some day we will become an empire. Did everything go well afterward? Yes and no, because the matter of expansion was a very sensitive issue. My father enlarged his dominion only within the old city of Cusco. However, there were small settlements that enjoyed the fruits of our work without any formal allegiance to us. My old mother counseled me, Sinchi Roca, for now it is not in your best interest to proceed with any acquisitions, or you will alienate the old friends of your father. Wait until you have a legitimate heir. Thus, and for the rest of my life, I expanded no farther than what my father had extended. Sinchi Roca, in awe I have listened to you. You were an exemplary leader and conducted yourself with prudence. As we come to the end of our soul trip, in spite of your years, you have remained unwithering as those leaves of youth. Your body has aged, but your soul is as youthful as you once were. Counter soul, you who thinks that my life was as flawless as my running was, how I wish I would have been able to use the destructive talents that I had mastered, so that I could be remembered. Now, at the end of my life, I feel that I have missed something. You, who comes from the future, tell me if wars are necessary to be a man of history. Wise old Inca, your question is of paramount importance. For that is the essence of mankind. We will forever cherish war, and we will always be creating our own fields of misery. So, in answer to your question, wars are not only necessarily for personal enhancement, but also for the advancement of the world. That is why long after you left, the empire was beset with wars, and in the old world even greater conflicts that became world wars. Perhaps, in the not-so-distant future, we will be fighting galactic encounters. Then, without having waged any wars, what is my legacy? Since no wars of great scale were fought in your watch, your legacy has been lost to us. But why? Because, men who try to use the power of reason will always be circumvented by the evils of mankind. Counter soul, I have aged so fast that I can only remember the great feast of the sun celebrated every new year, which may number to no more than fifty, representing how long I lived. Of all our accomplishments there is no greater event than the birth of a child, who will carry on our hopes and desires for a better destiny to come. 
So, as I am to leave this earth, I will continue in the person of my son Lokupank. Wise old Inca, aging and dying is a must, but we all are destined to continue living in the future of our children. As we come to the end of our encounter, we want to listen to your last words of wisdom to remember you by. Oh, Kunter Soul. Your visit to my past has brought me joy and also an existential hopelessness, after learning that my descendants are in the dungeons of our wrongdoings. Unable to help them, I can only implore to the gods of my inert world that someday the Inca people will liberate themselves from their own bondage and that of foreign oppressors. Therefore, I exhort to all of you to learn of our history. In it, you will find the treasures and disenchantments of your ancestry. For ignorance of one's legacy is like not wanting to be remembered by one's own progeny. Thus, do not be ashamed of what you once were, but be ashamed if you deny who you are. For if you never accept your ancestors, you will live a life full of thorns in your hearts. With these last words, man of the future, I wish you the best in your journeys to the past, and remember to carry in your heart the evergreen leaves of the Winehuena to remain forever young in spirit.